Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I'm an avid family historian who's been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with now nearly 20,000 people collectively recorded in my trees. Episode 1, Infanticide. Today's story is about a young lady called Sarah Simpson, and as the title suggests, there may be distressing details for some, so please exercise caution. So Sarah Simpson uh, was a, uh, a part of my family tree um, that's in my husband's, in fact, and it's his great, great, great aunt. And going through the process of recording the basics, her births, her deaths, marriages, children, I uncovered uh, quite a story. So Sarah Simpson was charged and jailed for concealing the death of a child. So I'm going to tell you her story today. First of all, I'm just going to look at the background of Sarah. Uh, her parents were John Whittaker Simpson and Susanna Mitchell, known as Susan. John Whittaker Simpson was in fact born John Whittaker, and that was his mother's maiden name. He was a twin. Uh, he had a sister, Elizabeth, and they were born on the 19th of August, 1815, at Kildwick, Yorkshire, England. Their parents married three months later and on the day of their marriage, the twins were baptised. He married Hannah Silson under the name Whittaker in 1837 in Otley, Yorkshire, England, then aged 21. Uh, Hannah died only three years later. He then went on to marry Susanna Mitchell in April 1841 in Manchester, Lancashire, England this time under the name of Simpson. The couple emigrated to Australia within a month of marrying. On the 29th of April, 1841, they embarked from Liverpool and arrived in Australia on the Elizabeth in August, 1841. John recorded his trade as a blacksmith. Uh, his father was a blacksmith also in England, and he was brought out by A.B. Smith & Co. Uh, as a contracted free passenger to Sydney. And his religion was recorded as Wesleyan and that he could read and write. Susanna Mitchell was two years older than John. Uh, on her marriage certificate, she left a mark which indicated she could not write. However, on the shipping records, she indicated she could read. Her father was Jonathan Mitchell and he was a parish clerk. Sarah Simpson was born at Taylor's Flat, Manaroo, in a region of New South Wales. Uh, on the 24th of April, 1843. In subsequent uh, birth certificates of some of her children, she's recorded her birth as being at Newtown in Sydney. However, the New South Wales birth certificate mar marriages certainly indicate it was Manaroo. She was baptised in the Church of England at mar Manaroo on the 25th of February, 1844. By the time she was three years old, the family had moved to the Mount Macedon Donnybrook area of Victoria. There's no definite records uh, showing the death of her father, John Simpson. On some family tree records, it's 1852 in Donnybrook in Victoria. However, others recorded as 1855. I do know, however, that Susanna Simpson, Sarah's mother, uh, known as Susan, went on to have children with a man named James Haslam. There's no record showing they officially married and there's certainly indicators uh, that uh, they didn't officially marry. However, one of the Haslam's children's birth certificates do state that Susanna and James married on the 21st of June, 1855 at Rocky Waterholes, Victoria, which was later known as Donnybrook. However, in James Haslam's will, he left his will to a Susan Simpson, so indicating the marriage didn't occur legally. James Haslam was a carter in England he was in fact a convict and was sentenced to 14 years for shoplifting, which was his second offence. And Haslam, in fact, was at Manaroo around the time that the Simpsons were, so possibly uh, had met each other or were in contact with each other at the time. And he continued his occupation of a carter and carrier in Australia. Sarah moved with her mother and stepfather to Deniliquin, New South Wales, by March 1856. Deniliquin uh, is in the southern region of the Riverina in New South Wales and was known to be a, um, a very big stock crossing area. 
And around the time of the gold rush in the 1850s, there was much demand for beef and lamb and mutton down at the gold fields. So this crossing uh, allowed uh, cattlemen to bring their cattle down from Queensland um, and also to have uh, sheep grazing and produced in the Danilicon region. Sarah married George Robert Newton on the 24th of November 1864 in Danilicon, New South Wales. And he was listed as a carpenter and Sarah was a servant on the marriage certificate. George Newton had been born in England and he emigrated to Victoria in 1852. His first marriage occurred to Alan Flanagan in St Kilda, Victoria, and they had three children. Two of the children didn't survive beyond um, 1863, and Alan Newton in fact died in 1868 of tuberculosis. There was one child that did survive, um, George Edward Newton, and all three children were born uh, around Inglewood in Victoria, so around an hour's west of Bendigo that was known as a mining region. So just as an aside, George Edward Newton, the son of Ellen and George Newton, uh, was found neglected in Maryborough, Victoria on the 3rd of April, 1865, at the age of eight, uh, which is interesting because Sarah and George Newton married into Nilliquin in November, 1864. So this child uh, was, was committed to care for one year. After the one year of um, care, um, he was again committed for another seven years and on the records the reason for committing into care was that his father deserted him. Uh, he, when he was committed to a further seven years he was sent to the Sunbury Industrial School. And the Sunbury Industrial School for boys was notorious uh, for uh, the ill treatment of children, um, starvation and physical abuse. And unfortunately for George Edward Newton, it looks like uh, he suffered the same fate. He died at the age of 11 on the 30th of July, 1868. So very sad for him with his mother dying um, at you know, such a young age and then his father leaving him behind. So with George as a carpenter, um, we don't know why he came up to Deniliquin and how him and Sarah met, um, but they had a son, John Hector Charles Newton, on the 31st of December 1865 in Deniliquin. Unfortunately for Sarah, by the time we get to February 1870, so when their child was a little over five years old, uh, she'd been deserted by George Newton. George Newton then pops up in the records in the 1st of September 1873, so around three years later, where he married Avis Ann Appleby in St Arnold, Victoria. Uh, so effectively committing bigamy as um, there's no record that Sarah and George Newton uh, had divorced and, and that soon becomes apparent in future children Sarah has. He was listed as a carpenter at the time of the marriage. Uh, he went on, it seems, to have a happy marriage with Avis. They had 12 children. When George deserted her, Sarah worked at John Waring's house in Deniliquin as a servant. John Waring was a well-known person in Deniliquin at the time, whom Waring Gardens was named, which is one of the parks in the centre of Deniliquin today. He was one of Deniliquin's most enthusiastic citizens, and under his guidance, the bridge, roads, railway, town hall, national school, school of the arts, the water tower, memorial park, and Cressy Street Gardens all came into fruition. When Sarah worked for them, John Waring was a council clerk for the Deniliquin Municipal Council and a surveyor. He died in 1885, and three years later, the town renamed the Cressy Street Gardens, Waring Gardens. There is an obelisk erected as a tribute of respect and acknowledgement of services rendered that still stands today. And on my Facebook page, I'll put a link to the Deniliquin Historical Society's story on John Waring. On the 31st of December 1870, it was reported in the local paper that Sarah was committed to trial for willfully murdering her infant. And I'm just going to have uh, a read of the article itself and the details of the coroner's inquest. Deniliquin Pastoral Times, 31st of December 1870. A woman named Sarah Newton was committed for trial at Deniliquin the other day on the charge of willfully murdering her infant. 
She was a married woman, but her husband had been away from her for some time. The coroner's inquest. An inquest was held at Mr. Gibson's public house on the body of a child found in the water closet of Mr. John Waring. And the water closet was in pretty much a toilet as we know it today. Senior Sergeant Baker deposed that from information received, he went last night about nine o'clock to a water closet on the premises of Mr. Waring, South Deniliquin. He saw no marks on the seat or the floor of the closet. He took the lid off the seat and the floor off, and after removing about a foot of soil, which was principally water, from the sewer pool, he found the infant female child, then before the inquest. He took it up and washed it and saw no marks of violence on it. It appeared to be a healthy and well-developed child and to be pretty recently dead. This morning he searched the closet and found afterbirth and he delivered both the mother's, the child and the afterbirth to Dr. Wren for examination. He saw Mrs. Newton then before the inquest last night at her mother's place. She was very weak and said, I was going down to tell you and Dr. Noyes about it, but I, but I was too weak. He told her that under the circumstances she would have to remain under the charge of the police until the inquest was over. She then stopped at her mother's place and the constable remained with her. Dr. Wren being sworn, so that he had examined the body of the infant child forming the subject of this examination. It is that of an infant well-developed and born at the proper period and whose birth had taken place quite recently within the last four and 20 hours. The navel cord had been divided by some blunt instrument. There was no bruise or injury externally. All the internal organs were perfectly healthy and from the condition of the windpipe, lungs and stomach, there is no doubt that the child was alive at its birth. From the collection of filth at the entrance of the windpipe and in the stomach, he believed death to have been occasioned by immersion in fluid similar to what he found in the stomach. He examined the lungs and applied the usual tests and from the appearance and condition of the lungs, he believed that respiration had been perfect. He could discover no other cause of death beyond what had been stated. The navel cord was divided at the thickest portion and apparently was partly cut and partly torn. Mrs. Newton was asked if she desired to give any evidence, but at the same time continued not to say anything likely to criminate herself. All the evidence she had to give was what she had told Sergeant Baker the previous night. Christina Waring, wife of Mr. John Waring, deposed that Mr. Newton was in her, Mrs. Newton, sorry, was in her employment yesterday, washing, and was also there on Tuesday and Wednesday in the previous week. While Mrs. Newton was working for her, she noticed that she was large with child. Towards the afternoon, she observed Mrs. Newton go to the closet very frequently. Yesterday, about one o'clock, she was there for some time. She saw her come out and go to the wash house. She was suspicious that something was wrong and accordingly went into the kitchen. Mrs. Newton was sitting there in a chair and spoke first. She said, addressing the witness, I have been confined in your closet. I am very sorry that it had happened. She asked Mrs. Newton where the child was and she said it was down the closet, that she did not wish to conceal it, but that she was taken very short. She also said that the child was a month before its time and that she thought it had been dead for some time. Shortly after, she became very bad. Mrs. Newton could have seen her go to the closet from the wash house if she had been watching. In brackets, it says that the jury here left the room to examine the premises of Mr. Waring. Mrs. Newton stopped at her place till eight o'clock in the evening when she left to go home. Sarah Newton was examined and stated that she was the wife of George Newton and resided in Deniliquin. She did not know where her husband was it was 10 months since she saw him last. She had no wish to conceal the birth and she had no time to call for assistance. As soon as she returned to the wash house, she went to the kitchen and told Mrs. Waring what had happened and Mrs. Waring sent for her mother and that is all. She's the mother of one child. The child with which she was confined yesterday was not her husband's child. She declined to say how the child came down the water closet and was sure that she had only had one child and was never in the family way before during her husband's absence. Sarah Haslam deposed that she was a widow residing in Deniliquin and mother of the last witness, Sarah Newton. Her daughter is a married woman. She has not been living with her husband lately, but, but lived with the witness and never saw that her daughter was in the family way until Mrs. Waring sent for her yesterday. 
She noticed certainly that she looked rather stout, but never spoke to her about it. When she went to Mrs. Waring's, she said to her daughter, what's the matter? She replied, I am very ill, but that was all she knew about the matter. Her daughter slept at her place last night, but she had not spoken a word to her at any time about this transaction and will swear that she never noticed her in the family way before, except when her first child was born and was not aware that she ever had a miscarriage or premature birth before. Senior Sergeant Baker was recalled and stated, he produced a plan representing the garden, the kitchen, the watch house and closet on the premises of Mr. Waring's house. The watch house is an open shed built onto the end of the kitchen. Looking through the fence at the garden, Alice's attention was directed to the spot. He received information about half past eight o'clock and went to the closet about nine. He believed that the coroner got information of the occurrence a short time before he did. Mrs. Waring was recalled at the request of the jury and said that she thought there was time for a woman to be confined during the time Mrs. Newton was in the closet. She could not have been confined in the watch house, wash house without her knowledge, but she might have in the closet without leaving any trace. She did not examine the closet after Mrs. Newton said she had been confined. This was told her at one o'clock and she did not give information until eight in the evening. She had nobody to send and Mrs. Newton was so ill that she did not think it was right to leave her. At six o'clock, her husband went uptown to inform the coroner, uh, but this morning, Mrs. Newton asked her to inform the police of the occurrence. She had never noticed Mrs. Newton was in the pit of the closet. She made no effort to raise it because she dared not leave Mrs. Newton, who was very ill, and because she knew that life would be extinct before Mrs. Newton told her what had occurred. Moreover, Mrs. Newton told her that the child had been dead for some time. So that was the inquest. The jury's verdict uh, was that they charged Sarah Newton with willful murder. Uh, and then she was committed to trial at the next circuit court at Deniliquin in April next. So the next article is um, the verdict. And it said the court opened on Monday, the 3rd of April before his honor, Judge Hargrave. Mr. Lance appeared as Crown Prosecutor. Sarah Newton, charged with the murder of a female child on the 27th of December, pleaded not guilty. The Crown Prosecutor withdrew the charge of murder and substituted that of concealing the birth. The jury returned a verdict of guilty of endeavouring to conceal the birth. His Honour spoke kindly to the prisoner and considered the inhumanity of her husband marrying her and forsaking her without any fault of her part called for sympathy. The sentence would be light, but he had hoped this fact would not induce anyone to esteem the offence a light one. The prisoner was young and might yet lead a moral and happy life. And the sentence was six months in Deniliquin jail. So in her jail entrance record, uh, she has stated that she was born in Sydney, as we know it was in Manaru. And some of the particulars that give her a little bit more of an idea, uh, she was 27 at the time uh, of this sentence. Uh, her occupation listed as servant. She was five foot five and a half, slight build, fresh complexion, brown eyes, brown hair. She could read and write. And with the remark column, it mentions how she had a smart, respectable appearance. In the coroner's inquest on uh, the death of her daughter, uh, the details say that she was a female infant offspring of Mrs. Sarah Newton and the findings were lit written as murder against the mother. It seems after she completed her sentence that she moved to Hay, which was where her mother, uh, Susan, and her second husband or partner, as we know, James Haslam, lived at this point. She gave birth to a daughter in January 1873. So by February 1873, uh, she was suspected to have committed infanticide. Uh, however, uh, once brought to court in April 70, 19, 1873, the case was discharged. So it talks uh, about um, this in, in paper clippings, uh, saying that on Monday morning last, which was on uh, the February of 1873, 
the Uchika police received a telegram from Deniliquin to the effect that a woman named Sarah Newton was wanted for infanticide at Hay. Upon inquiry, it was found that she had already crossed the Murray in the company with a man named Davis, who drove a sprint, sprint cart and a pair of horses. Sergeant Cleary at once telegraphed to Sandhurst, or Bendigo as it was known later, and Runnymede, and mounted Constable Couch started on the trial to Echuca. After some trouble, the constable traced the fugitives in the direction of Higgins Station, 18 miles from Echuca, and back to the Rochester Road, and from thence to within sight on Runnymede, where he overtook them and arrested the woman and placed her in the lockup. The prisoner was brought to Echuca by the midday train yesterday, and will appear before the court this morning, with no doubt a remand to Hay will be asked for. And on the 12th of February 1873, it says the Echuca Police Court infanticide. Sarah Newton was brought up by the police charged with child murder and was remanded to Hay, New South Wales, at which place the alleged offence was committed. On the 22nd of February 1873, the article states the Hay infanticide case. Sarah Newton, who it will be remembered, was recently remanded from the, this court to Hay, New South Wales, upon the charge of child murder, was brought up at the Hay Police Court on Friday and remanded for evidence of Dr. Gordon. We learned from the standard that circumstances of the case occupied the attention of the coroner's jury some weeks ago when the accused was acquitted. The Attorney General for New South Wales has taken a different view on the matter and it was in accordance with his instructions that the present information was filed. So it seems that for poor Sarah being unwed, uh, well, not unwed, but her, her partner uh, leaving her, um, that it wasn't as simple as what it is today, where you can seek a, a no-fault divorce um, and be able to continue with your life. So for her, unfortunately, um, she's falling pregnant and, and doesn't really know uh, what to do with that in her circumstances. By 1875, she is recorded to be in a relationship with Thomas Johnson. Now, again, there's no record of this marriage. We know that um, at this point, the marriage to George Newton uh, wasn't annulled. So uh, from 1875 to 1877, she had two children, uh, both with the name Newton, um, even though the father's details were not given. The first son, Thomas William Newton, took on the name Johnson for all other documents throughout his life. Um, and there's no other birth recorded in 1877, hey, for a Thomas Newton. Um, so I'm unable to gather further information on that. Um, Thomas Johnson was a shearer. Thomas and Sarah went on to have two other children, Abbott, Albert and Sarah Mary Elizabeth in 1880 and 1884. Albert was born with Sarah's maiden name, Simpson, in Bulligal, New South Wales, which is near Hay, and it was listed as an illegitimate child, um, like his brother was, and Thomas grew up using the surname Johnson for all documents. Um, Elizabeth's birth certificate has um, not been able to be found. So because of her marriage to George Newton, she was compelled to call the first two children that we assume were with Thomas Johnson under the new name uh, and then the subsequent two children um, they've had to be put down as illegitimate however they've taken the Johnson name on. So um, Sarah Simpson died of tuberculosis at the age of 49 on the 14th of August 1892 in Bulligal. She was recorded as Sarah Johnson, not Sarah Newton on her death certificate and it is recorded by one of uh, by her uh, by Thomas, her partner, um, that she was married to him and that they had married in Ball Legal, even though there's no record of that. An interesting link in this story is that Susan Haslam, so Susan Mitchell, who went on to um, be with James Haslam, had children with him, and one of those children was Mary Jane Haslam. She was also charged with infanticide. And the interesting part of this too is that you'll notice in the court records for Mary Jane, as they were with Sarah, um, it seems that Susanna or Susan had uh, some kind of um, 
contribution to the events. Um, she was questioned on her involvement and on her knowledge in both cases. So I'm just going to read um, some articles in regards to Mary Jane Haslam. So the first one's on the 3rd of October 1876 in the Evening News, which is a Sydney newspaper, and it says, Supposed Infanticide at Hay. On Monday morning at the Crown Hotel, an inquest was held by the coroner um, to the circumstances by which a newly born child was found in the Murrumbidgee River on the preceding day and it had come to its death. John William Payne, a plumber, gave evidence to the effect that on Sunday afternoon he was walking his dog along River Street. As he threw in a bottle for the dog to bring out, the do dog dived in and disturbed something which came to the surface. He told the dog to bring it out and he brought out a bag and laid it at the witness's feet. In the presence of his wife, the witness untied the bag and took out a piece of brick and a small bundle wrapped up in a piece of grey blanket which he found to contain the body of an infant child. He sent for the police officer, Sergeant Kelly. The witness then took the body to the courthouse accompanied by the police. The witness saw the bag first about 15 feet from the bank of the river. Sergeant Baker stated that from the information received on Sunday, he went to the house of Mrs Haslam, one of the prisoners, and saw her and her daughter, Mary Haslam. They were standing together in a room. He said he had come to take Mary Haslam into custody on suspicion of killing her child. Mrs Haslam, which is Susanna, said why she never had a child. Who, who was it that spread that report? I have had her sick in here, here in the house with me for the last six months with a cold. On examining the back room, the witness found a piece of blanket which he produced in court. Mrs Haslam said it was an ironing blanket. The witness then told Mary Haslam that he must arrest her on suspicion. She said she never had a child. The witness then took her to the lockup. He again went to Mrs Haslam's house on the morning of the inquest and told her he would have to take her into custody as being an accessory to the crime for her what her daughter was suspected with. She said she did not know anything about it. If anything of the kind had happened, she would have known and that the report had been circulated through spite. He then sent her to the lockup in custody. The spot in the river that was pointed out to him by the witness main was about 60 yards below the residence of the, of the prisoners. The bag in which the body was found had the name of SNA Moss printed on it um, and was um, the blanket was found uh, round the body corresponded with the blanket found by the witness at the prisoner's house and it appeared to have belonged to it at one time. The two pieces would make a whole single blanket. In the fireplace were several brick bats similar to um, those that were placed around the body. John William Main recalled identifying the articles produced by the last witness as those found with the body and stated that when he first unfolded the body out of the blanket there was a very large protuberance on the forehead or brow, very much discoloured. When he saw the body next in the presence of the doctor, the swelling had disappeared, the discoloration remained and the child was stretched out to its full length. Dr. McMullen gave evidence to the effect that he had examined the body of the infant. The body appeared to have been from two to three days in the water. That morning he had made a post-mortem examination. The right lung was found to be a bright red colour. The left lung assumed to be inflated. Decomposition had so, been so far advanced he could not make any examination of the brain. Having examined Mary Haslam, he did not believe that she had been confined during the last 10 days. The infant would not have been long born before its death. At the request of Senior Sergeant Baker, the inquest was adjourned for Thursday the 28th of September. So the next article is on the 5th of October, so two days later in 1876, and it just mentions in the Riverine Herald, which is an Echuca Moama paper, a young woman named Mary Haslam is out on bail, charged with infanticide. Her mother is implicated. A sister of the defendant has twice been before the court charged with the same offence, the first time being discharged and the second time only a short term of imprisonment. So this is alluding to Sarah, which they did get mixed up. She did get imprisoned the first time and then um, it was being discharged on the second offence. 
So we move up to the 11th of October, uh, so a week later, uh, and this is the inquest and the findings. So it's saying here that they found the body of a male infant in the Murrumbidgee River at Hay uh, on Tuesday morning. The jury previously sworn having answered to uh, the deposition taken at the first inquiry, and this is additional evidence. Senior Sergeant Baker stationed at Hay deposed to having uh, sworn in the previous inquiry examined several blankets and found that the, the piece that was around the child um, also was found in the house of Susan Haslam uh, with the length proportionally complete. Um, it had been washed with a new piece that was found around the child and uh, it was used as an ironing blanket in the home and the appearance of both was very similar. It was believed the piece was the original part of the blanket and judging from the material, it was the same. There were some marks that the iron had been made on the blanket that was around the child, as well as portions of the large blanket, um, but it was not stained all over. The witness had asked Mrs Haslam what she had done with the piece that was torn off the ironing blanket, to which she replied that she had never torn away any of it. It had been left at her place about three years ago by a little man named Johnny Watt, who went to the diggings and she had not seen him since. The blanket had been lying in a box for the last six months and when she took it out and used it, it was for an ironing blanket and it was the same state to when she had found it um, to its size. The piece of the blanket that the, uh, the constable found um, was only half as wide as the ironing blanket that was produced. In reply to the questions from the jury, the witness stated that he had not found any traces of stained linen on Mrs Haslam's premises that would hear, bear upon the inquiry, and he had not made any inquiries to whether or not Mrs Haslam acted as a midwife for any one of the last 10 days. John Richardson deposed that he's a shopman in the employ of H, M, H. Williams & Co. The witness had been in the employ of Mrs. S. N. A. Moss for about um, to the end of last June, and he said that there had been bags of a similar kind of that produced at the store, and they were sold with flour in them. Mrs. Haslam was a customer at the store, and at times she got 50 pounds of flour in a bag similar to that produced, and other customers had done the same. To the jurymen, some 100 of these bags go out. I did not know anything to connect this particular um, bag produced with the Haslam family in any way. Anne Geyer, wife of H. Geyer of Hay, deposed that she had been in the habit of acting as a midwife and had 22 years experience. She knew both Mrs. Haslam and her daughter. She believed that Mrs. Haslam had acted as a midwife on one or two occasions to oblige the parties. She knew the girl, Mary Haslam, and she saw her some time ago, around nine and a half months ago, um, about the time that Dr. Leslie attended her. About six weeks afterwards, she saw the girl at her own door in Hay and noticed she was pregnant. She could tell by her eye, the witness was about four yards from her. She had taken particular notice of the girl from what she had heard. She did not see the girl again for some time, not until around 10 weeks ago when the witness noticed she was very stout she was sure the girl was pregnant. She thought at the time that she had about within two months to her confinement. Last Sunday week, she saw her again and noticed her altered appearance. She believed that she had been confined. The witness was of the opinion that a young woman should not have milk in her breasts unless she had a child or miscarried. The witness here related um, that she alleged to had had a situation occur about 21 years ago, having reference to the preservation of a dead child in cold water. She had seen the child um, subject to the present inquiry. It was more decomposed than the one she had referred to. She was of the opinion that the child found in the river had been nine or 10 days born, and perhaps that time, whole time in the water. She said that there was a storm on the 15th um, and that was um, when the witness accepted that it was the time that she had visited the house. When at Mrs Haslam's house that evening, the witness was told by that person that Mary was very ill with a cold and at her re request went in to see the girl whom she found in bed. The witness had not asked how the girl was. 
She did not notice anything particular about the girl who had bed clothes around her. She had known Mrs Haslam to attend Mrs Stubbs in her confinement about six years ago and at times had seen Mary Haslam about and thought she was getting stouter, but it was um, no business of the witness and she did not take much notice. She thought the girl might have been pregnant, but wouldn't have liked to um, take much notice and say that as a witness. She thought um, the coroner briefly addressed the jury, reminding them of some of the more salient points in the evidence. During the coroner's remarks, he refers to Dr. McMullen's evidence as hearing uh, upon the life of the child, but the doctor explained that he had stated in evidence that the child had breathed, not that it had lived. And on reference to this deposition, um, that the word breathed must be used. After a few other remarks by the coroner and the doctor, the jury retired to consider their verdict. After a lapse of over two hours, the jury returned a verdict to the effect that the deceased child had died from natural causes and that there was no evidence to show by what means the body was placed in the Murrumbidgee River. Sergeant Baker uh, on request compared the pieces of blanket and um, expressed the belief um, that the reply to the jury and witness that there had never been any unpleasantness um, between Mrs Haslam and Dr. McMullen, duly qualified medical practitioner, deposed that it was quite impossible to state the cause of death. He believed it was from debility, but not, would not swear that it was so. He did not believe that the child had died um, from either hemorrhage or drowning. It is usual for the umbilical cord to be first tied and then cut. This course would be adopted unless in great emergency. In this case, the cord was torn. From the appearance of the child where the witness first saw it, he should have taken it to have been dead about five days. It had changed very much during the night. An immature child would decompose quickly. Has heard in Mrs. Geyer's evidence um, that they, she would not swear positively the child had not been born in 10 days. A running stream would preserve a body. The blanket and bag around the child would not preserve it from decomposition, although it would preserve it from injury. An immature child would be weak should be sorry to give the opinion as to the person's pregnancy by seeing the eye, but they believe that Mary Haslam had been pregnant at some time. And Mary Ingstrom, wife of Alfred Ingstrom, deposed that she knew Mrs Haslam, had resided next door to her, and from her window she could see Mrs Haslam's premises. Mrs Haslam and her daughter lived alone, with the exception of a grandson of 11 years, and was um, who likewise lived in the house. She had frequently noticed Mary Haslam looking stouter than usual. She noticed it six months since. She saw the accused almost daily and noticed she grew stouter until last Monday fortnight after the witness saw her when she was very slight and pale looking. She saw Mary Haslam on Tuesday the 19th when she came into the back door. She shook a cloth and returned very quickly. She had noticed that the back door closed, was closed more than usual for some days prior to the 19th. She believed that Mrs Haslam had at times acted as a midwife and she had attended um, the witness. During the week, the door was shut. It was very windy. She had at one time uh, had friendly terms with Haslam's, but some remarks which the witness had made concerning Mrs Haslam's daughter had been related to her, um, had caused coolness. And a last uh, witness was Emily Watson. She said she was acquainted with Mrs Haslam and her daughter and she had passed their house on the Friday night um, and it just records how she had noticed that Mary Haslam uh, was not looking stout. And the last uh, part of it was the Riverine Grazier, so the Hay newspaper on the 11th October 1876. And it says, for some time past, the quiet of our neighbourhood has been somewhat diverted from its ordinary grove by a degree of excitement, consequence upon finding the dead body of a child in the Murrumbidgee River and the arrest of Mary Haslam and her mother. The verdict of public opinion in this case has been divided, that it is next to impossible to divine anything like accuracy in which direction it is intended. The evidence adduced at the adjourned inquest held Thursday last 
a report of which we publish on the fourth page, which I've just read, does not commend itself as remarkable for clearness or discrimination, and therefore we cannot wonder at what somewhat vague verdict was returned by the jury. A more complex case could hardly be imagined, and the position of the jury was both delicate and awkward. Acting, however, upon the acknowledged rule of giving the parties accused the benefit of any doubt, we think the jury did well in not committing themselves to such a serious matter as the committal of Mary Haslam for infanticide, especially as it was generally understood that the police were likely to take the matter up in another form. On Tuesday the 3rd, the Haslams were charged at the Hay Police Court with concealment of birth. The evidence was almost identical with that given at the inquest and occupied the time of the court until after one o'clock. At the conclusion of the evidence, Mr. F. W. Reid addressed the bench on behalf of the defendants contending that there was no case to go to jury. His worship, however, thought differently and committed both parties to trial on a bail of 40 pounds each and at the sessions held in Hay at an earlier date. As the case now stands in view of the committal of the accused, we refrain from making any comments upon this case, but we contend in the view of the fact that infanticide and other kindred crimes are on the increase in quality, colony. The police are quite justified in doing all in their power to unravel the mystery con connected to the body found in the river. True, the child may have died from natural causes, or what is more likely, it may never have lived. Yet those connected with the affair must have been heartless and inhuman. We trust that the committal of the Haslam's will not in any way retard the police from making further inquiries in the matter in order that the guilty parties, whoever they may be, may be brought to justice. And for us today, we see it as an unspeakable crime, but we do need to place ourselves in the context of that time. And these young women who uh, are not married or their husbands have deserted them, um, didn't have any type of welfare support uh, like we have today where single mothers can live um, without fear of being judged and are able to be financially supported in order to bring their children up. So it is unfortunate that we look back in history and see that it wasn't the case uh, in those times. So I hope you've enjoyed my story today on Sarah Simpson and Mary Haslam. Please visit my Facebook page, Family History Mysteries, to get in touch with me if you have a story that you would like told and shared with everyone, or if you have uh, started your family tree and need assistance to really um, bring out these stories like I have with mine.